Hey gang, it is Wednesday. Unlike Sunday when I did another one of these shows, boy how time flies. Anyway, today is hump day. You know what that means. It's time to go backstage with the dentists in the know. We are your backstage pass to current trends, politics, and education in the dental world. We are live and we are over a cocktail or your favorite beverage of choice. You know the routine here. I'm with my besties, Dr. Jennifer Bell and Dr. Chad Duplantis. AKA the Trout Slayers. The Trout Slayers. Oh, Chad keeps dropping out, so we'll leave him out if we need to. Anyway, we are all practicing dentists. We are all educators, and we are all business owners. Guess what our job is? It's to bring all of you in the know. We have the Alamans, the Doctors Alaman um, from Utah, from the Alaman Biomimetic Dentistry Center, uh, where they have the mastership courses in biomimetic dentistry. Um, so that's really exciting to be talking about. And um, just in the brief time that we had a few minutes before the show started, um, I loved what they had to say. Uh, about, you know, not being the best at everything, that it's really hard to do that. So stick around. Just a few things, if you don't mind indulging me. So first off, I want to give everybody a heads up, if you're not an ADA delegate, that there's a really interesting resolution coming forward. And I bet our guests will have a little bit to talk about on this subject. Um, there is a resolution coming up to address amalgam use in clinical dentistry. Um, and, and this is an interesting modification or take from where the ADA has sort of stood on amalgam dentistry for quite some time. Um, I don't dare to have an opinion on this quite yet. I want the, the house to really vet what direction they want to go. But for the, for the first time in quite some time, we're seeing uh, amalgam as a restorative material coming up for full debate in the ADA house. And so I think this will be an interesting opportunity for us to have an open conversation about amalgam use. And I think that there's some, some interesting twists that I'm seeing out of this resolution, um, some of it having to do with environmental protection with the use of mercury, also an equity debate. So the, so. While we've always debated the merit of amalgam and its use in clinical dentistry as a restorative material from a very uh, scientific perspective, I think, um, th there's a lot of politics actually starting to come into play with the use of this material as well. So this could be a very interesting discussion amongst uh, clinical uh, specialists and dentists all over the country. And uh, I certainly will be watching to see how this settles. Um, certainly, so will lots of other organizations as well, as they look at their own existing policies to determine if it's time to make some modifications. In addition, I think in particular, I guess our guests were sort of spurred to come on a little bit by another fellow guest of ours that came on um, probably about eight months ago, Dr. Brandon Walker specifically talking about direct restorative materials and the ADA's current endeavor to seek uh, guidance and commentary, but also to create policies and procedures for full carries removal and direct restorative material placement. So I'm eager to get our guests' opinion on this particular committee's work and also what they expect to maybe see out of this particular uh, finding the publication is expected to hit JADA sometime in 2023. Open comment period, which I had mentioned a few weeks ago, closed at the end of August. So they've sort of collected their due diligence. They have um, sought all the counsel that they are going to seek. I believe the committee is now deep into their um, decision making phase and coming up with final uh, discussion points. So as a restorative dentist, I'm eagerly awaiting just to see what I have to put up with later, I guess. I don't know. We'll see if this is actually beneficial or not. In addition, um, I thought this was really interesting. So in Boston, I think last week, there was a dental uh, new up and coming 
companies and ideas within the dental space. It's called the Foresight Dentech Conference. It was held in Boston. I believe there were 30 different companies that presented new and innovative ideas within the dental space. Um, so there were lots of attendees uh, there for this particular conference to talk about all the different startups that were within the dental space. The winners of the competition were Keystone Bio, which was a developer of a novel therapeutic that shuts down a driver of chronic inflammation and uptime health, which simplifies the dental equipment maintenance and purchasing using predictive analytics. I know I'm actually excited about both of those. I think there's a lot of unique opportunities within the dental space to address chronic inflammation and more and more um, articles are coming out. Not not too long ago, an Alzheimer's connection with chronic inflammation and periodontal disease. We've got the cardiovascular link, pregnancy link. We've also got cancer links. So there's a lot of uh, commentary and discussion around chronic inflammatory disease processes like periodontal disease and its contributory factors towards other systemic presentations. So companies that are invested and in looking at opportunities to identify and treat I think are definitely worth giving um, some additional consideration to. And then those companies that are out there hopefully streamlining what a small business owner has to go through on a daily basis, not just with the clinical dentistry of being the widget maker, so to speak, in our own little factories, but also managing the staff and the maintenance protocols and other things, the preventative maintenance requirements, facilities maintenance requirements, of running a small business. So I love that companies are finding that this could be a good endeavor from an entrepreneurial standpoint and certainly from a profitability standpoint, but also addressing and identifying a need in the dental space, which I can tell you is certainly required. So with that, you know, I posted a link of um, a lawsuit that was settled just this week on a pediatric case. It was a $95 million settlement on this particular case out of Texas. Um, I think there's a lot to learn from this particular scenario. So if you have a chance and want to dive into the nuances of that pediatric case, I think we can always learn from uh, our, the learning experiences of our colleagues so that we can continue to provide excellent patient care and patient safety. And with that, that's all I have for today, guys. Um, our guests tonight came uh, to my attention. I've been kind of following them and watching their work on as they'll report to you on Instagram. In that's, their, Chad, that's code for stalking. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Sliding into the DMs yeah. um, on biomimetic dentistry. And I am genuinely intrigued. And, and I think, you know, Dr. Walker, who was on our show um, many months ago, and we talked a lot about that. And, and it was an under educated area when we were going through dental school. And I certainly still find myself curious about the techniques, the philosophy, the modalities of biomimetic dentistry. It's, it's certainly an area that we're not, well, at least when I was coming through dental school, not an area we were highly educated on. So I think a lot of people are genuinely curious and want to understand better. And as we've said before, once your eyes are open, your pursuit and desire to want to do it better, you can't kind of shake it. Like it sort of echoes in the back of your brain. So when the ADA came out with this direct restorative material campaign that they're now on about how, how they're going to address clinicians removing caries and how they treat uh, carious lesions, uh, Dr. Walker mentioned that these two would be a fantastic addition to our show, not only to talk about this particular initiative, but also uh, to talk about um, biomimetic dentistry in general and what they're kind of champion and teaching other dentists to do. So, uh, you know, without further ado, Davey and David Allman are going to join us tonight. And we're going to talk a little bit about biomimetic dentistry. Thanks guys so Golf much clap. for agreeing to come on. Golf clap. Great. All right. Great Thanks. to be here. We're, we're really excited to be here and I can't, uh, I can't thank you guys enough. If you, anybody wants to come to Utah and, you know, get stuck to where their flights get canceled and they no longer can get back home. That's exactly what happened to Brandon. I thought he was going to be out here for two or three days and he ended up no, being what? Like seven days. So, you know, I've got a spare bedroom for anybody who wants to get. get Is that how y'all ended up becoming so close? It was because he got no, stuck? No, 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 no. Instagram. 
So Brandon was one of our early doctors that went through our mastership program. And how we actually got introduced was actually kind of a, I wouldn't say. Interesting situation. It, it wasn't a very <laughs> smooth transition to our friendship. Let's just put it that way. And then you know, eventually, just like some of your best friends, you know, you start out as maybe sworn enemies. And then yeah. all of a sudden you realize you have a lot more in common than yeah. <laughs> well, I could think of a lot worse places to get stuck yeah. than out by you guys because I can find stuff to do in the summer there and I can ski all winter. So exactly. exactly. We had great snow when Brandon was out here and yeah, and snowboarding. Yep. yep. We got Are those snowboards or skateboard decks snowboard behind you? Yeah. What was that? Are those snowboards or skateboard These decks? These are skateboards. So here's a couple of skateboards and then Got to figure that's, out. That's that's rad. That's oh, those right. are awesome. awesome. There you go. So this that's is our awesome. this is our little recording studio where we do a lot of our a lot of our trainings and you know I'm surrounded by by skateboards that I've collected over the over the years. I just bought one that has a tube of toothpaste that, that one of my that's really I Instagram love that. followers said, "Hey, that's you need awesome. you need to get this uh, skateboard." I'm like, "Do you have a link?" And so yeah, I'll, that's. I that's awesome. awesome. Well, very, very cool. Thank you all for being here. Absolutely. So let's get right into biomimetic dentistry. And, you know, I, I've read so much about you guys. And um, actually, David, we share a common dental hero. One of the first lecturers that I really began to follow and and chase almost like a rock star was Ray Bertolotti. Um, he brought modern bondodontics to the United States from Japan and totally changed the way that I practiced. Now, I had only been out a couple of years, but my understanding is that you had been kind of frustrated with the direction of adhesive dentistry and the state of dentistry. So tell us a little bit about that journey and mm -hmm. and uh, what made you get into all of this? Yeah, so uh, after 17 years of doing traditional dentistry, my frustration with uh, sensitivity after restoration, uh, retreatments in three to five years, endodontically uh, involved teeth after I've done, done perfect crowns, all that kind of thing. It was not satisfying after 17 years. Uh, the first 10 years, I just thought everybody else's dentistry that I was replacing was just because they weren't as good as me. I was, you know, trained at University of Pacific, the top level. And, but then for the last seven of those 17 years, I was replacing my own restorations, finding my own failures, and it just was not satisfying. So I quit and told my wife, you know, I don't like this. I'm not, I'm frustrated. I know you're frustrated. You got seven kids, but you know, we'll find a way to feed them. But then my <laughs> idea of becoming a history professor, I was enrolled in University of Utah advanced uh, graduate history courses for six months. But, you know, PhDs in history start out junior colleges about in those days, 40,000 a year. And we were making more than double that. So my wife was praying like crazy that I'd somehow be able to find dentistry again. And I found Ray Bertolotti. I just went to a two day course in January at Huntington beach where I grew up Southern California, left the snow. I say, what the heck, if this guy doesn't know anything, I'm still going to enjoy these two days in yeah. Huntington beach. Two days later, I called up my wife. I said, I don't know if this guy is smoking dope or what, but if half of what he says is well, maybe that too, but <laughs> well, he's from San Francisco, you know, so I'm like, hey. but uh, anyway, uh, it turned out half of what he said was right and half needed to be improved. And then after he gave me, gave me a bibliography, I started uh, going seriously into the published literature from around the world. And uh, it's kind of like once I started, the questions never ended. And Eventually, Ray Berlotti couldn't answer the question, so I had to find answers that were beyond Ray and some of the other early mentors, uh, Gary Unterbrink. I don't know if you ever took any lectures uh -huh. from Gary Unterbrink, but uh, he was an early mentor. Uh, and then eventually, the implementation of six areas into my practice changed everything. And so after five years of literature review, I had a system 
that I had been using for a couple of years. And then I used it for three more years. So I had a beta test in my own office, monitoring how many teeth had to be retreated, how many teeth needed endos, how many crowns. Well, I eliminated crowns. So once you eliminate crowns and you don't have failed crowns, so it would just be a failed uh, adhesive restoration. But the, uh, the, the outcome after five years was so positive, I thought, you know, I shouldn't just keep this to myself. I'm glad I'm a, a dentist now, but I know a lot of other frustrated dentists. So I started to introduce some teaching in 2003 to other uh, dentists. Uh, one dentist is still practicing here in American Fork 20 years later. He's been using the six lessons approach that I invented for that long. And he's been very successful and other dentists for that long of a period also. But, uh, the system that we uh, that we that I developed and Davies carrying on the the teaching um, has very unique uh, concepts and they're proprietary. They're patent pending. You know they're not patented, but they're patent pending. That just means I ran out of money because attorneys make so much money more money than dentists. It was like you know, but the idea is that we have some proprietary techniques that we'll share with you tonight. And those proprietary techniques have been posted on Instagram for three years. So uh, my youngest daughter, Davy's younger sister, is our boss and she runs our business. And she had the uh, insight over three years ago to use this new platform called Instagram, which I only knew through uh, when I was lecturing on the road a lot uh, 10 years ago and Cable television came up and the reality shows with the uh, Kardashians, you know, it's like the Kardashians use Instagram. I don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> 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 but she said, no, you know, you need to see that there is a way to use that for marketing. And when I was teaching from 2003 until um, uh, 2019, marketing was always the biggest headache. You know, everybody had ways to get your website up. Everybody had ways to collect your list on your emails. Everybody had ways to optimize all of the, you know, Tony Robbins, I'm going to make you famous, blah, blah, blah. You know, so I did a lot of those to figure out how to run an internet business. And the cumbersome approaches from an internet email-based collecting of email address business um, it works pretty good if you got if you're selling widgets, but if you're selling twelve thousand dollar educational programs, you know I'm competing with John Coys, I'm competing with Frank Spear. I get that, but it's like you spend twelve thousand with us, and you get ten times what you would get at Coys or Spear. How do I know? Because I've been trained by Coys and Spear. That's just the bottom line. I'm their same age. We're all seventy one years old, and it's like I know what I know. I know what they don't know. Here it is. If you want to learn how to fix a tooth one time, I mean one time, we've been doing this for 22 years and we have restorations, direct composite restorations that are 22 years old. Now, you can't just do that knowing what you know. Now, you know a lot, Jeff, you know a lot, Chad, you know a lot, JB, but you don't know what a biomedic dentist trained in the six lessons approach knows. Just because I've talked to thousands of dentists. I used to talk full time for QRA for three years and I'd give 24 lectures a year all over the country, all over the world. And I'd give a one day introductory lecture and, you know, the number of dentists after one day, they just take a notes like question. I'm just going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. But that's never enough. If you want to eliminate a hundred percent of your problems, if you're okay with eliminating 80% of your problems, then that approach might be good enough for you. For me, that was never good enough. If somebody gave me an opportunity to go from 80% success to 85%, I get on an airplane and learn about that. If I can get from 85 to 90, I get on an airplane and learn about that. If I can go to 80, 90 to 95, I, and 95 to 100, I had to go to Japan. I had to go to Italy. I had to go to Mexico. I had to go to how many countries? Of, Korea. You know, it's like I've got friends around the world who have done serious dental scientific research that nobody knows about. 
and it impacts the outcomes of your dentistry. And so, you know, if somebody wants to listen to me and say, oh, God, I, you know, who, I, uh, he's crazy. Well, that's well, true. That, <laughs> you know, that's just the way it is. But I've you been get away it, with that, Davey. <laughs> I've been doing this for 25 years. And if you find somebody that knows more about adhesive dental research than me, let me know so I can get on an airplane and have a face to face talk with them. But the bottom line is that I've never found anybody that can come close. Well, what does that mean? That just means that I have spent more time reading than any sane human being would be. You know, in the first six, seven years of this research, since I originally met Ray Bertolotti, I spent three to four, my wife says, five hours a day for four years. Now, that is... He also has a photographic memory, so he can read a boring mm. paper, put it to memory, and then figure out how it fits together with where all the else. puzzle pieces go yeah. together. So, you know, I'm trying to say, look, God, if you've given me a gift and I need to share it, I guess I will, as long as I don't starve. I'm not starving. I've got too much weight to carry around. But we do have seven kids. So, I mean, it's like they got to go to college. They got to get music degrees. They got to go to dental school. But the Army paid for Davies Dental School. So that's that helps a ton. But let me just summarize these six areas. The first area is caries diagnosis and treatment. Every dentist thinks they know how to do that. No dentist that we have trained that we have trained knew how to do it. Pascal Magna and I wrote a paper 10 years ago. It's been downloaded 100,000 times around the world. It is like the basic paper. And the question for JB and Chad and Jeff, have you read that paper? I'm going to right now. <laughs> All right. I like, you, I like yeah. you, Jed. I like yeah. you, Jed. I like you, Jed. That's I'm a all huge Pascal Monnier yeah, fan. Right. So, yes, yeah. I will read that yeah. paper. Yes. If you see all of the key opinion leaders, and like you, Pascal Monnier. Oh, yeah, you can talk for a long time about Pascal Monnier, how great he is. Blah, 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 blah. But in reality, what really matters is what he has published in the scientific literature. What really matters is what I've published, Davies published, but we have, you know, 200 doctors that have contributed to 130 articles that we teach the masters in our course. And those 200 doctors, if they make a contribution, it needs to be actually understood in the framework of everything else. And so you read this paper, that'll be your first paper, Chad, and then you'll share it with Jeff and then JB. And all of a sudden you guys are going to go, How come this isn't taught in every dental school in the world, not just USC where Pascal used to teach at or University of Geneva where the biomimetics in a lot of ways started or, you know, you can go to the Koi Center and he'll recommend it. It's on his reading list. But how many of the people at Koi Center read that before they learn how to do implants and do dentures and do perio and do everything else that is not restorative dentistry. But the a way to get to the carriage removal endpoint can be visualized just by going to Davy's Instagram account. It has over 600 cases with carries removal endpoints illustrated in a photograph. And if you read the paper, you can see what he's doing. Now that's the foundation and that's called lesson one. In lesson one, you also have to deactivate MMPs, which if you don't do that, you're gonna lose 25% of your bond uh, in your hybrid strength. So you have to deactivate that with chlorhexidine is a very easy way to do that. And the paper that you read for that is from Dave Pashley and Franklin Tay. And that paper was published in 2004. So if somebody has heard of MMPs but doesn't deactivate them, what good does that science do? You know, do they not believe it? You know, hundreds of papers have been published about MMPs. Why isn't every dentist an expert on these matrix metalloproteinases that can destroy quarter of your bond strength in the first 12 months. Okay, that's just a summary of a lot of the, but in lesson one, you have to use caries detecting dye in every tooth that you treat, 100%, no exceptions. That's the fundamental principles of biomimetic dentistry. Now, lesson two is the diagnosis of what we call structural compromise. You have to understand when you look at a tooth, particularly a tooth that's been restored or a tooth with a fracture or decay, you have to analyze the amount of tooth structure that is now going to be incorporated in the restoration. 
if there's substantial amount of tooth, then the tooth will restore, will support the restoration. Traditional operative dentistry, that's what they shoot for. Hardly ever do they achieve that. I mean, once the last time that you did an isthmus on a virgin tooth and you were able to prepare that at 1.5 millimeters. Yeah, I mean, you know, never, you know, never Chad or, or Jeff are, are not drinking Mountain Dew. Even Mountain Dew will make your hand shake to two millimeters. But in lesson two, you learned out that a two millimeter isthmus all the way, you have gone from 40% reduction in fracture uh, resistance to 40%, to 60% reduction of fracture resistance. So now you're in an area where just by a normal GV black prep, you can break a tooth at 400, uh, 200 pounds per square inch instead of 500 pounds, which a normal tooth would be. Now, that uh, is a foundational understanding of how structural weakness happens as a result of traditional mechanical approaches in dentistry, which include bio, uh, bonded restorations that don't stay bonded. If you have a bonded composite that loses its bond on one side, which is pretty much 100% of bulk fill restorations do that within the first two years. Yeah, when Jeff asked uh, Davey, how long ago did you graduate? Oh, I said 2015. He's like, oh, it's seven years. You know everything about everything in dentistry. And I said, no, 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 no. I only know, I'm only an expert in one thing. And we could probably summarize that as doing a class two composite correctly. If yeah. you can do a class two composite correctly, you prevent everything so much else. More Every five years, you're preventing the retreatment. Uh, Pascal Magna has called that the treatment recycle or the cycle of death, all of that type of thing. If you do a class two with biomimetic principles of stress reduction, then those are proving to be permanent restorations. So okay. I love what, yeah, David, I love what you, what you brought up. So one of those, one of those articles, you know, and, and let me first go back to the thing about articles, because we all know how much literature we're all bombarded with. And the reason, one of the reasons that we wanted to do this show was to find some of the people behind the research that's out there. Because once you find somebody that's really trying to do great dentistry and not just trying to push a particular brand or push corporate, you know, then you subscribe to their articles and all of a sudden those articles come in all the time. But unless you know to look for that particular author, right. it's really hard mm -hmm. to find them unless you're researching a specific topic and you stumble across it. So right. to, yeah. So to your point, you know, that that's something that's that's amazing that's going to come out from this is that our viewers and our dinks can actually follow you guys now and say let's let's see some of this research okay Look. but i'm just going to do a full disclosure following us on instagram will not be enough yeah, uh, yeah. it will not be enough a hundred percent of the time so today we had a doctor from dubai sign up for the mastership program and today we also had a doctor from iraq sign up for the mastership program. Both of these doctors are the top of their country. They've been following us and trying to do literature reviews and try to incorporate the biomedics for a year without getting trained. And then, you know, today they kind of sheepishly said, yeah, well, yeah, we need more help. We have more questions. You know, everything you're saying is making sense, but to put it all together, I need a mentor. And so that's just the disclosure. I'm going to say that everything that we're saying right now is always going to be say, find a mentor, find a mentor. Okay. Yeah. And there's yes, probably the other people. And there's probably four in the world that would be good recommendations. Pascal Magna is one of them. DDA Dici is one of them. Simone Della Perry is the third one. In other words, four people developed independently biomimetic restorative dentistry. Only four that I know of. And that's based on literature review and as soon as I found found them, I got on an airplane, contacted them, and we got mentored by them or tried to mentor them. But the idea is that each of these four and others that we've trained are teaching around the world. We estimate that last year, our mentors alone have trained 100 doctors. We've trained 120 doctors. 
but basically every year we're having hundreds of doctors around the world train in a way to fix a tooth the right way so it stays fixed and never goes to a crown. So we're able to eliminate 100% of crowns and that benefit uh, eliminates endo and eliminates uh, retreatment of crowns because you don't do a crown in the first place. So, so Davey, I, I want to hear when, when, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but Davey, I want to hear when you decided that this was the direction that dad's not crazy, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you said that, but I know you didn't mean it because you're following him and you're teaching it and you're living it. So there was a point where you said, dad's kind of got his stuff together and I'm buying into this and I'm going all in. So tell us a little bit about your experience and and how you've kind of taken the ball and, and run with it at the center. Perfect. All right. So I can I'm number five of seven kids. So I'm I'm in a Mormon family. We have usually Catholics have a lot of kids and Mormons have a lot of kids. And, I'm, not, and I'm number five. And all of my older siblings, they decided to do something different than following in dad's footsteps. And when I'm about 10 years old, I'm taking an interest in following, you know, my idol, my dad. It's like, oh, I want to be just like my dad. But every time I, he came home from work, I would say, how was work? Well, I didn't know what being a dentist meant. And he simply said, well, I cut a couple of teeth down for crowns. I had to do a couple of extractions, you know. You know, I don't really care. Like, let's go hit some golf balls. And as a 10 year old, that's great because I am starting to learn golf because he's my hero and my hero is going to go and spend time with me. And I'm going to be able to be the favorite child of the seven. <laughs> and so we go hit golf balls and I start to become a pretty good youth golfer because my dad hates dentistry. Now <laughs> in seventh grade, I'm in Miss LaFlame's class and she teaches a careers class and everybody had to bring a little sheet of paper home and see if their dad would come and speak to, to their class. And so I did the same thing. I said, mom, dad, I need to get this signature to see if dad will speak, if he's willing to do that. And I guess he signed it because he came one of the, uh, one of the days. And all of a sudden, my dad's talking about fixing teeth way different. Now, at that time, I had had a couple of silver fillings, and I didn't really like getting my teeth worked on. And then all of a sudden, he is passionate about fixing teeth. And this is way different than how he was three years prior when I was getting taken to the golf course. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing a different version of my dad where not only does he love his hobbies off of, you know, outside of work, but he's also passionate about fixing teeth, which was so different than what I remembered him three years before. And so as I'm 13 years old, or uh, I think that's how old a seventh, seventh grader is. Yep. It was at that day. And I know my dad didn't realize that he was going to influence, influence me, but that was the day that I decided, Hey, I'm going to be a dentist. And if I can make a tooth look like a tooth, cool. Hey, that's way better than what I had previously. Silver. Yeah, you don't want those silver things. And so, from seventh grade to to now, I have been passionate about becoming a biomimetic dentist. And I didn't know what a biomimetic dentist was. My dad was just becoming an, an adhesive dentist at that point. That was maybe maybe two years after getting introduced to Ray Bertolotti mm. and him embarking on this this massive undertaking of going through a literature review of adhesive dentistry. Now, one thing that, you know, makes me a little hesitant on the second area of dentistry that I'd like to get better at is the idea of, I know how hard it is to figure out how to fix a tooth with materials that every dentist thinks that they're great at. And it's not just one or two articles. It's thousands of articles. If you come to Utah you go to my dad's basement and it's like, you think, you think hoarders is bad. Imagine dental article hoarders. And so like, you There's know, when, only one. when my dad passes away, I'm going to have to figure out what to do with 3000 copies of articles that are, that aren't just read. They're copiously 
a note taken on it. And it's like, I am so grateful that my dad's genius was able to synthesize a way for me to fix teeth better. And now it didn't make my dental school easier. I got, I think I'm the only person in my dental school that was put on academic probation because I distinctly went against, you know, a faculty direct direction, you know, you got to put put glass on them or base in that restoration. And and so I did totally against the literature. And as soon as the the faculty walked away, I zipped it out with my (laughs) handpiece. You know, all the men's can't keep secrets. I was no different. I told a classmate and that somehow got up to the deans. And for the last two and a half years, I had to figure out how to stay under the radar enough to graduate. So the, the first miracle is that I graduated from dental school with the knowledge that I knew because it made a couple of faculty a little bit on edge. And the second miracle is I survived my active duty in the military. <laughs> so it's very good. Well, very I, good. I, why do you think that that is the case? Why, why is it that, I mean. Well, speaking man to woman, it's a man's problem. And so I've, I've visited 37 dental schools of the 66 in the United States. And I talk to every level. The faculty that are on the floor, they're excited. Yeah, let's learn about this. Yeah. As soon as I go to their administrative boss, it's like, oh, man, I don't know. We'd have to, you know, go talk to. And then I finally get up to the assistant dean or a couple of times to the dean. But all of a sudden, these men are saying, hey, we already know it. We, we're we good with this. We know this. And I'm going, bullshit. I don't say that. I don't. I don't it would that. be okay if you did. But uh-huh. the idea is that, you know, I'm close to death. If somebody wants to lie to me, you know, what, I, what can I do about it? But if I know the literature, I know the science, and the dean and the assistant dean and the administrator on the floor don't know the science, but the teacher on the floor and the students want to know the science who's stopping that from happening and you know i'm a little hot about that and uh, we have uh, six or seven dental schools in the world right now are incorporating our approaches in their universities and next month i'll be giving a two-day course at the next university that's coming online it's in knoxville tennessee called lincoln memorial university i don't know if you've heard of that but that school started two weeks ago and one of our masters has been doing the biomedic dentistry for 16 years in his private practice, is now retired from his private practice, and he's uh, part-time at the school. And he gave a presentation on biomedic dentistry and the, the head of the new operative department that in a couple of years is going to have a clinic full of patients said, man, I think you should be the head of this. I don't know this stuff. And Dr. Erpenbach said, well, I, you know, I'm, I can teach it, but, you know, my mentor knows it a lot more, so... Anyway, so that's in the works right now. I'm very excited about that. But in my view, it's malpractice. It's against the Hippocratic Oath to do something that can harm a tooth if you can prevent that. And the harm of a tooth, doing an amalgam, everybody thinks, well, the mercury is not good for you. Well, that's true. But the harm of the tooth is that a tooth that's not connected side to side moves not together, but separately. And that causes fractures and leakage that makes the tooth at risk of re-decay and fracture. Every dentist sees teeth that break. No dentist thinks they could ever have done anything differently. And I know that they could have because I've been doing it for over 20 years. And I've been training 500, 600 dentists who have my telephone number that if what I teach them doesn't work, and they have a failure before 20 years, I want to hear about it. We need to find out because everybody else, they're doing a restoration as lasting 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years, depending on how long ago they, they learned it. And so the question for a dental school is, if I could teach you how to do a restoration that would last 20 years, because I always say a large composite, how long do you think a large composite is going to read? They'll do a Cochrane analysis. They'll do a literature review. And all of a sudden they'll say, well, the NIH, you know, tells us five years. I mean, you talk about the ADA. I personally have appeared before the code committee for six years in Chicago in February. That's not a fun time to go to Chicago. Mm-hmm. Giving them the science, spoon feeding them the science. And now 10 years later, they've got an idea. Maybe we need a code for deep carries. Well, (laughs) 
10 years ago is like, yeah. <laughs> but but JB's with you. She hates going to Chicago in February too. Yeah. 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 yeah she that. never goes. There is not a code for placement of a rubber dam. Uh, I'd give anything for your passion. It's amazing. Um, well, I do want to address. Yeah, we've had a couple. A longer, just yet, so we want you in the mastership, so you can carry on. Well, part of the reason I, 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 I love here that when my dad, you know, teaches Calm or or we're on a podcast together is like, you know, his fire is contagious. Yeah. Yeah. And my biggest worry is that he, you know, he'll have a stroke and all of a sudden, <laughs> well, you know, we just got back from there, India. There will only be one day of all of them. We just, we I just, don't want that burden yet. We just came back from 14 days in India. We trained 47 uh, doctors there and talked to three dental schools to a couple of hundred uh, students and practicing dentists in India. I mean, what's the excuse? Why are dentists in India being trained faster than they're being trained in the United States? It's about even right now. Outside the United States and inside the United States, we have about the same number of doctors that are seeking this high level of training on restorative dentistry. Next week, we're getting on a plane and giving lectures in Budapest, Hungary, and in Bremer, Garmers, Germany, Garmers, Germany yeah. to 160 military dentists. Dave, I mean, that, an that answer is twofold. Yeah. The preponderance of corporate dentistry and the amount of student debt that everyone's coming out with that Absolutely. they feel like they can't afford the education that makes them better dentists. Yeah, it's immoral. Yeah. It's like, why would a school charge three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars and not five and five? I mean, students coming out of NYU, it's immoral what I mean, unless your dad is Saudi Arabia oil rich, you know, you're going to be in debt for a long time coming out of NYU, educating 400 dentists a year. Well, and, and I'm going to get a little political here, which we don't typically do and say student loan forgiveness is not going to make the dental schools lower oh, any they're, of their tuition. They're going to increase it another 10 grand or whatever <laughs> they're going to, you know, forgive. Yeah. That's right. They added on. We're, we're not addressing the problem. No, and that's that's one big thing that we see a lot of the doctors that come through our program. They're about four to seven years out. They're totally burned out by how they're being treated by corporate cor corporate dentistry, and they don't see a way out to gain the passion that they once had when they first got into dental school. Yeah. And that's because they're having unpredictable results. They've paid a ton of money, and there's a lot of frustration. And it's because they don't know the foundation. And this foundation of six principles that really boiled down why composites will last three years, five years, 15 years, 20 years. Depending on what you do with it, how you use it's how you use the materials, not what materials you're using. And that's mm -hmm. uh, such a paradigm shift. I mean, I can show you exactly how to make a restoration last three years or 30 years. That's just it. And the amount of time it takes for the dentist is usually, usually between 20 and 40 minutes. And so you have a certain amount of your money you're charging for composite in the subconscious, the, the dentist is saying, crap, I'm not gonna make any money from this composite. Let's just put a crown on it. And that's what happens every, every day. And if crowns never failed, but what will the insurance pay for retreatment of crowns? What's the, what's the cutoff that they see 90% of the doctors is feeling comfortable with five years. Five years. Totally yep. get it. And well, just, I, go ahead. Well, I was just going to address the couple. We did have a couple quick questions. Yeah, yeah go for we it. Usually, we do try to get our guests questions on. Actually, Sarah Morris is watching and she follows you a lot and she wanted to ask a couple of things. Nice. Um, one Carries detecting dye versus deep dental tube stain. What product do you recommend that can delineate the difference? All right. So that's why this paper that my dad referenced, the first time I read the pre-publication of the 2012 paper, and remember, he is my hero. <clears throat> I'm sitting in, and I'm learning a lecture about pins. I'm in my second year in dental school. And I'm like, why am I, why am I even at school today? I should be playing golf. This is stupid. Yeah. <laughs> well, I read the pre-publication of the 2012 paper, which was a decade ago. And I call up my dad and he lives two miles from the dental school that I'm attending. 
And I say, Dad, this is the Sistine Chapel of dental research because it makes the dentist or the dental student better the following day. Yep. How many of you that are listening to this today have dealt with a direct pulp exposure this week, yeah. this month, or, so, or even today? Well, if you read and really understand the genius in this paper, you don't have a pulp exposure. You'll have like three a year. Maybe. You might have one a year. You might have zero a year. Yeah. And if you can make a diagnosis that this tooth is vital and you understand how to seal in the caries deep near the pulp and have a caries-free uh, peripheral seal zone around the perimeter that has a highly bondable uh, connection side to side, front to back that it mimics the natural tooth, guess what? You're going to accomplish the first goal of biomimetic dentistry, which is to preserve, preserve pulp health. Pulp health. Yep. The second goal is to conserve tooth structure. So the need for endodontic therapy and traditional retention form, resistance form with uh, traditional crown preparations is greatly diminished or all eliminated. but eliminated. Yep. And so with caries detecting dye, it's an old technology. But if you use it like the inventor once, uh, once said, you remove all stain. But that, that leads to a problem. Pulse. You're going to expose more pulps. Yeah. Because as you do get closer to the nerve, you have an increase in uh, tubule density and also the lumen size increases. So you could have what we call pink haze, which could be considered caries free, but it's still picking up a hint of um, uh, color. So what's the solution? The solution is to know how deep you are in a tooth. Measure. On average, it's about six millimeters to the pulp. So you stop at five. And so, you know, the genius decided, it's how about not... we just stop at five? Five millimeters from the occlusal surface in the center portion of the tooth where the pulp li lies. If you have the restraint to stop and you leave all red or all pink, and now if it's red or pink, you know, there's, there's carious tissue at this juncture, but you have to have the restraint to just say, I'm going to seal this caries. I know what the bond strength or the bond potential is in this area, and I'm okay with it. As soon as you get that, you're going to have a lot more success with your indirect pulp caps. Yeah. Well, I would totally you, agree. You know, we can show you a thousand teeth that any dentist not trained in biomimetics will send for root canal treatment. I mean, a thousand teeth that have now been treated for 20 years, 15 years, 10 years without endo. And the endodontists we've trained are doing vital pulp therapy. They're not doing the endo because the tooth mm -hmm. tests vital. We've had some endodontists have a health check. You know, if, you know, if you're a soldier and the soldier doesn't show up to formation, that's what they do. They have a sergeant go and knock on their door to make sure that the soldier is, is okay, that there wasn't any self-harm. Well, that's what endodontists do when it, they're referring general dentist stops referring them endo. <laughs> we've had and we've had dentists that we've trained. We've had multiple this past year that they've had calls directly from an, their endodontic office and asking, "Have I done something to offend you?" <laughs> I'm not getting as many referrals. Are you as seeing I, someone <laughs> else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like actually, I just. You know, the, the diagnosis of irreversible versus reversible, I'm more confident that I can keep the vitality of the pulp on these deep, carious. Right. Regions. And internationally, most dental programs start after 12th grade. If you're in India, if you're in England, you go to dental school starting your, your first year, what we would say in college. Five years later, they have a dental degree. And then if they specialize, the specialty around the world that's most popular is a combination of endo and restorative. They do a master's degree in endo and restorative. Several of our doctors are experts in this specialty. And now it's like 90% restorative, 10% endo. Where before wow. it was like 60% endo, 40% mm -hmm. restorative. So and I think we have a subject for a whole new show. Yeah, right. yeah. Hey, hey, we, hey. Like to, we like to get brought back. Hey, yeah, I, I mean, honestly, I would this love like to just three. talk about this topic of pulp capping, 
and Karen I'd love to have and, Walsh on the show too. And yeah. and bring yeah. Walsh on. I I mean I think we have a great part two that has yeah. come together yeah, here. Yeah, but bring it on. yeah, but listen, guys, we are out of time, and right. I I just want to say how much we appreciate your enthusiasm for our profession. That's what that's what fills our yeah. heart. Are are the people who just are really trying to do great dentistry and advance the profession. So well, it was really thing. our honor to have you both on and to talk about your program. Real quickly, do you have a website that they can go yeah. to if our viewers want to learn more about your program? Yeah, it's either allamancenter.com or drdavidallaman.com. We'll both uh, link up to our mastership program. It's a nine-week uh, live interactive a Zoom platform uh, training where we go through one of the lessons of the six lessons. And these are recorded so the dentist can re uh, review this because if you're going to learn something, you have to be able to review it. So we're not afraid of giving you the information and not just, you know, pigeonholing it is like, oh, you can't, if you weren't smart enough to remember it the first time, <laughs> the last thing we want yeah. is to train somebody halfway. Plus, and if they mention Dinks, They'll get five hundred dollars off the tuition. Yeah, uh, Chad, did you hear a dinky deal? I heard yeah, a dinky deal. deal. We'll give we'll we'll a dinky deal. But yeah. then we have uh, ten months of additional one-on-one -on -one mentoring with the doctors because we really believe that the personal relationship is what gives us the feedback as educators, but also the confidence of the of the doctors to really go outside their their comfort zone because we're telling somebody. The real way to fly an airplane is actually upside down and backwards. <laughs> yeah. That didn't work out well. <laughs> yeah. That's a good <laughs> analogy. So, so the six lessons approach, it's a different way to fix teeth, but it is a systematized way to approach even the most structurally compromised teeth. So you no longer have to cut teeth down for crowns. Well, so I diagnosis the treatment of caries. That's lesson one. Diagnosis and treatment of structurally compromised teeth and Including how to deal with cracks, cracks into dentin. What to do is with lesson cracks. two into dentin. Lesson three: immediate dentin sealing, resin coating. How you can increase your bond strength four hundred percent. Lesson four. Lesson four: C factor stress and stress reduction. Rib rib on placement for deep margin elevations. Lesson Let, five: on lay preparation. Preparation. Lesson six: occlusion. That's the hierarchy of importance. So occlusion is the least thing in a restorative dentist's life. Most general dentists think they need to get trained in occlusion so they can be like whoever, but yeah. it's just the opposite. And so if we do get brought back, we will go deep dive into lesson one because no, I, the I, I love most this. important. Yep. All well, right. Well, I'd yeah. like to thank you all both for being You're here. You're very welcome. Uh, we'd love to have you back. We'll do a deep dive. We'll, we'll maybe have a debate with an endodontist. Love to see that. But, uh, but well, we'll bring in our endodontist and debate your endodontist because our endodontist. There you go. There you go. There you go. Because in other uh, words, the endo is all contingent on the ability to stay bonded. See this hat says get bonded, stay bonded. So like stay hat. bonded is only when you're educated in lesson four. Lesson four, you have 20 articles that when you read them, your head is going to spin. But it's the only way to learn what's called polymerization dynamics. Composites move. And the movement of composite has to be controlled by a biomedic protocol or else you will lose your bond circumferentially before you lose your bond in the middle of the tooth. But in our technique, you don't lose your bond any place. So yeah. everything at any depth will be bonded and sealed, but that's only by controlling C factor and polymerization dynamics. Yeah, imagine my surprise being asked to speak at the AAE meeting. April this year, and all I've, the endodontists are listening to And I've only completed one endo since I graduated dental school, because I know that the endodontists are better than me. So why would I? <laughs> there you that, go. That's all right. Most of the people but, but coming like, out of dental school now have like, not done any. So. <laughs> it's like coronal seal, the endodontists that attended that lecture, they knew that in order for their endos to not get screwed up by general dentists, they have to be able to seal the tooth on the top. So. And we know, figured out how to do that, so we can have another well, class on that. All right. All right. Well, we've got well, we've got a great part too. So, guys, all right. thank you. Good so night. Take care. Right. Thank, thank you all. Thanks so much. All right. Bye -bye. Be good.
Well, I'll close this out by saying, I think it's safe to say he said he was 71 years old. I hope that I have that energy when I'm 71. Yeah. And I, I wish that I had the skateboard collection that Davey did when I was, what is he, 25? Anyhow, uh, <laughs> what a fantastic a uh, couple of doctors that are extremely passionate about. Wait, what they Chad, do. I thought you were 71. Shut up. Uh, <laughs> what, a, what, what an amazing couple of doctors that are passionate about what they do. And I think that's the biggest takeaway from tonight is that, you know, just whatever you do, be very passionate about it. And I know that there's a lot of great lessons coming out of the Alleman Center. Everybody take a look into it. Stay tuned for what's coming next. I'd like to thank Q Optics for their ongoing support. And I'd also like to thank Dental Ray for having us out there not last weekend. What a fantastic weekend it was. And I just look forward to the future of dentistry. Until then, keep it classy, everybody. Good night. Good night. And that wraps up another podcast for Dentists in the Know. On behalf of Dr. Jennifer Bell, Dr. Chad Duplantis, and myself, remember that we've got a great profession, so let's make it a great day, dinks.